Hi everybody and welcome to today's webinar. It's been a while since we've been back. I think we did the last one in late uh, December. Uh, we're happy to be back and today we'll be talking about Submicron Simultaneous Infrared and Raman and how it's being used at multi-user facilities like synchrotrons uh, from applications from life sciences to cultural heritage uh, all the way across to polymers uh, and much, much more. Today's guest speaker will be Dr. Ferenc Borondix. He's a principal beamline scientist at the Sims beamline at the Soleil Synchrotron just outside of Paris, a lovely place to be. Uh, a couple of, I suppose, housekeeping uh, points. In fact, there's really only one housekeeping point, and that is uh, any questions that you come up or have come to mind throughout the webinar, please type them into the chat box on your screen. Uh, and when we get to the end, uh, when we have time, and we will have some time, we may not get through all of them, of course. And anything we don't get through, we'll get back to um, via email. Uh, so really, without further ado, since there's so much to talk about, I'm gonna jump straight into it. Uh, so the outline today will be, I'll take you through uh, the well, some of the challenges and issues um, that, that people doing FTR and Raman microscopy are facing today. I'll take you through how OPTR overcomes virtually all of the issues that you're uh, having some pain with. I'll take you through then a range of applications uh, that people have published with. In fact, most of my examples are based on actual applications or rather on based on publications. And that'll be about the first half. Uh, in fact, it will be less than half, in fact, and, and the majority will be then um, Dr. Frank Borondix uh, going through his experiences using uh, this OPTR technique uh, at, at the survey synchrotron and what his users uh, that cover a wide range of application spaces have been doing and what they've been publishing on. So uh, I'm going to assume most of you are familiar with vibrational um, spectroscopy. So us to say that it's all about functional groups, and each peak, of course, is... Um, uh, representative of a particular functional group, and it's been it's been used for decades across a huge and wide uh, range of application areas. However, it has been around for a while. It is quite a mature technology, uh, and it, it it is really at the limits, its fundamental limits, um, and, and primarily it's all about spatial resolution because we're using long wavelengths in the infra in the in the infrared. Those traditional techniques such as the FTIR and some of these emerging. Uh, QCLs that employ long wavelengths are limited sort of 10 to 20 micron uh, region. Uh, other issues are that you know, the best spectra are obtained in transmission mode, but for that you need to cut them quite thin, 5 to 20 microns at most. Uh, but cutting things thinly is, is sometimes difficult or, or often even impossible. Uh, in those cases, you may be using a micro ATR, such as the one pictured here, uh, but that requires contact, it's difficult to position, there's contamination concerns, the crystal and all the sample can be damaged. Uh, so there are some uh, challenges there. And here's, here's an example of how the sample surface can be damaged with an ATR. Uh, these systems often, nearly always, require liquid nitrogen cooling, which is a bit of a hassle to handle. Uh, but one of the, you know, what I consider the uh, underappreciated uh, issues with these sort of traditional FTIR and QCL sort of direct microscopes um, is these dispersive and scatter artifacts. So imagine you have a thin film of a polymer, let's say a PMMA thin film, you measure that in transmission, you get a lovely looking spectrum, nice flat baseline, symmetric peaks, all looking good. But if you take the exact same material and make that into a bead, 15 micron bead in this example, measure that in transmission, well, the spectrum now looks very different. Baseline offset, you've got weird baselines, peaks are shifted and they split, change the shape, keep the material the same, the spectrum look different, Yet again, so it really goes to show how spectra can be very, very much particle shape, size, and even surface roughness dependent, uh, in addition to any chemical differences. Uh, so you've got to be very mindful of that. But when it comes to Raman, by far the biggest, biggest issue is autofluorescence, and that can often swamp the signal. You can mitigate some of that by going to longer wavelengths, but then you take a massive, massive hit on sensitivity, and that's on, on top of an already limited sensitivity that's just inherent. And fundamental to Raman spectroscopy. Uh, you can't collect single frequencies, you must collect hyperspectral, which and I'll talk more about single frequency imaging in, in, in the coming slides, but you know, full hyperspectral imaging can be relatively slow. Uh, there's power sensitive and power issues uh, because it is a low sensitivity technique, you're typically wanting to put in as much power as possible and it ends up being a fine balance between uh, as much power for best sensitivity versus minimizing or ideally having absolutely no sample damage. Uh, and then there's the issue of that the Raman spectra themselves can be dependent on the excitation wavelengths. Uh, this could be sort of sample related with 
uh, particular um, resonances, visible resonances uh, that may be excited in the sample. Um, for example, um, dyes uh, or, or inks, uh, for example, can, can have some strong resonances. It could also be the substrate. Glass, for example, doesn't work very well with 785. Right. Um, so all of those issues, I mean, you, know, you probably have experienced some or most of those. All of those have pretty much gone away completely when, when dealing with optical photothermal infrared as a technique. OPTIR is a pump probe optical spectroscopy technique where the pump is an infrared laser. That's the one that excites the sample. The probe is the short wavelength, typically a green 532 or, or a near infrared laser. And it's the probe, and it's through the probe beam that we detect uh, the the effect of the absorbances, the infrared absorbances. Uh, so with OPTI, we, we're delivering Raman-like spatial resolution, but with the richness of, of the infrared spectral uh, region. Um, we, we operate primarily in reflection mode, though certain applications do require transmission, but even in, in reflection mode, we end up generating transmission, FTIR transmission-like or FTIR ATR-like spectra in reflection mode. So none of the, the typical distortions, artifacts or fringes uh, that you might get uh, with FTIR when operating in reflection mode. It's non-contact, I mean, we've already mentioned that. And the spatial resolution uh, is actually independent of the wavelength. So it's constant across the entire wavelength. How might this uh, technique work? I've got a little video to take you through it. Uh, so it all starts with the uh, microscope objective. It's a reflective Cassegrain style. Uh, through that, we shine a pulsed infrared laser beam and being infrared it's fairly broad maybe around 10 microns at the same time we're shining in our probe beam the green that's about 500 nanometers the infrared generates thermal expansion as it's as it's expanding and that thermal expansion changes the way the green light is reflected or scattered back right so as we're tuning our infrared laser from one wavelength to the other we monitor the intensity of the green light reflected back and it's from that that we calculate out what is essentially a pure infrared spectrum collected in reflection mode. Uh, so speaking of modes, uh, one of the simple modes is where you just point and shoot. If that's your field of view, you can mark spots and, and collect spectra. And each one of these uh, spectra will come from about a half a micron spot size. You can work in array mode where you can draw a line. You can collect a line of spectra with a minimum step size of 50 nanometers or you can work in a, a traditional mapping mode where you draw a grid and you end up with a with a three-dimensional data cube i call this discovery mode because that's great for when you really don't know what might be changing but if you do know what you change what might be changing i, I call this targeted um, uh, targeted mode imaging you can employ single frequency imaging so rather than collecting the entire stack of images, you can collect only certain discrete frequencies. That's, of course, much faster. Uh, in this slide here, I'm going to attempt to compare and contrast traditional IR, and I'm going to lump uh, FTIR and some of these emerging QCL microscopy techniques into the one bucket. I'm going to compare that with Raman against a whole host of uh, key microscope um, characteristics or, or attributes. Uh, first one being uh, spatial resolution. And if you care about that, typically Raman is going to be your your choice. In thread, as we know, traditional in thread has this poor spatial resolution. If you're worried about fluorescence, of course, Raman is poor with that, and, and IR has no fluorescence issues. Spectral sensitivity, um, IR will win that race, and that kind of ties into speed of measurement as well. Uh, when it comes to the extensiveness of libraries or the spectral interpretability, it's important to, to remember, or if you don't know, to be made aware of the fact that commercial libraries out there have uh, about 10 times as many infrared libraries or infrared spectra in their libraries as they do RAM. So there's a, there's a huge wealth and depth of, of database out there in, in the infrared. So I'm giving that a green and, and RAM is much, much less. Uh, if you want to work in reflection mode, which is the easy mode of operating, it's kind of point and shoot, a sample prep isn't really so much of an issue. RAM is great for that. IR is really poor when it comes to any reflection work. Water vapor can be an issue with IR, not with RAM. Water solvents. If you're working with live cells, for example, traditional IR is a real pain for that. Uh, Raman's great. Glass mostly works well with Raman, does not at all with infrared. Uh, and this idea of, of having the spatial resolution being wave independent, well, traditional IR, it's not at all, but with Raman, it is. So if you look at that, it's no wonder, it's no surprise that uh, most labs will have one of each instruments. 
Depending on the needs of the experiment, you may go to one, you may go to the other, or you may even take the same sample and measure them on both instruments. And then, of course, is the challenge of, of finding the exact same measurement spot. Well, well, what we do with OPTIR is we take all of those and literally put them into one instrument. So you know, when, I, when, when I say it combines the best of both of, of traditional iron and Raman into a single platform, I actually mean that quite literally. Um, now, at the heart, I think I've mentioned the heart of this, uh, we really, the, the beginning of all of this is, is the infrared light source, and that's the QC on this case. So um, there, are, there have been some developments in those over the last year or so. Uh, our, the traditional or our, our standard Q cell, it covers an 1800 to 950, and that's done with three chips, these three sort of mini lasers within the one box. Um, if you're interested in some of the higher wave number um, areas, you can, you can opt for an additional OPO laser, that's 3600 to 2700. Uh, my favorite, uh, most interesting things for me are these sort of more custom, in fact, I probably shouldn't call them custom anymore, they become quite mainstream. Uh, the, it's the CH chip in particular that I'm quite excited about, the 3000 and 2700. And you can add that as your fourth um, chip, because you can house up to four chips in these in these boxes. And that gives you this range. And that, so that really covers the key functional groups uh, in, in the mid infrared spectrum. If you're interested in the silent region, you can perhaps replace the CH with a silent region chip. Or if you're interested in the long, long wave end, the low wave number in the spectrum, uh, you can opt for your fourth chip to be that one, in, in which case you can go down to 1800. Uh, your, in terms of probe, and the probe, of course, doubles as your Raman excitation laser, you can opt for a 532 or a 785. Uh, it's important to compare, I think, just to really appreciate that uh, OPTIR spectrum are indeed very much compatible and comparable to the decades of FTIR history and libraries out there. So in, in this slide, I'm going to um, compare reflection, sorry, uh, transmission FTIR data that, that have been collected in transmission mode of thin films. So these, are, these are library spectra. And I'm going to compare them to the same material but collected in reflection mode of a thick block, probably some millimeters, with OPTIR. So in this, so first example is polypropylene. Red's the FTIR thin transmission reference, and OPTIR is our thick reflection measurement. As you can see, that's a spot-on match. Same thing with polyethylene, PET, nylon, and polystyrene. Right? And, the, and the spectra here are in no way um, treated, transformed. These are literally raw spectra that you would get on the screen. Spectral resolution is something we talk a lot about. It's important to understand perhaps some basic fundamentals here. Uh, spectral resolution can be approximated by the Rayleigh criterion. Uh, so 0.6 times the wavelength in microns divided by the numerical aperture of the objective. Uh, and for traditional IR and QCL type measurements, this wavelength is actually a variable. Hence, if you plot this equation, you get a curve. So out here in the in the low wave number end of the spectrum, which is the long wavelength end, uh, your spatial resolution is much worse. And it gets better as you get to the short wavelength end. Uh, but with OPTIR, which is very similar to Raman, we have a we have a fixed um, beam, probe beam wavelength. Uh, in this case, 532. So plug that into here. Uh, together with a numerical aperture, you, you end up with 416 nanometers, and that's constant throughout the entire wavelength. I mean, that's where your up to 3630x improvement comes from. Okay, um, but one of our most exciting features is the fact that we can do infrared and Raman together. So these have been two complementary techniques that have been around together, often operating side by side, but never together and certainly never simultaneously. Uh, so now we can truly, can truly claim same spot, same sub-micron resolution, all done at the same time. So it's pretty useful to go through a very simple schematic of the instrument. So it all starts, as I always say, with the QCL laser. Uh, that is shone through our objective and focused down. At the same time, we introduce that green um, propene collinearly, and that's also focused down to a tighter spot size. And this is where that sort of photothermal magic happens. The reflected light uh, comes back and goes on to a visible detector where our infrared signals are extracted. Uh, but the magic or the really novelty here, uh, and the simple novelty as well, is the fact that we use a Raman grade visible probing uh, probe laser. So that means we've got Raman scattered photons here all the time. Whether we like it or not, whether we end up even using them or not, they're there. So we take advantage of the fact that Raman scattered photons are there by putting in a dichroic filter in here. So that's separating out those wavelength shifted and only those wavelength shifted photons. 
and that sends them off to our RAM spectrum where we get out our RAM spectrum. Uh, and those unshifted photons will continue to the visual detector where we get our infrared beam, infrared spectrum rather. And so in, in, this, in this fashion, we end up, and that's how we get that simultaneity. Right, so this really takes full advantage of the complementarity of IR and Raman. It's confirmatory as well. So your IR can confirm the Raman, uh, and the Raman confirms IR and vice versa. Okay, so that's really kind of the first half of my uh, presentation. And the sort of second half, I'm going to take you through a quick roadshow. I'm going to be pretty quick here because I'm pretty over over already. Uh, but I want to show you some examples of our publications. I think that's what drives uh, many people out there, is all of the publications being novel and first. Uh, and speaking of publication, they're certainly very much on the rise. Um, and you know, this is probably not the latest screenshot from our website. We've had uh, probably about five publications that have come out already in the last four weeks. Uh, and perhaps the biggest publication was late last year, and that was um, in, in Science Nanotechnology. And that had a massive impact back in 39. And this was actually a really, really thorough study. Uh, this is where they looked at uh, how uh, baby bottle teats or nickels, depending on which country you call them, uh, how the steam sterilization, which was always thought to be really safe, actually isn't. It actually sheds a lot of silicon microplastics or microparticles. Uh, you end up etching the surface. Uh, and, and, and through the unique capabilities of OPTR, they were really able to, able to dig in to that and, and look at the chemistry of, of the etched surfaces versus the unetched surfaces. Um, they were even able to you know, pull out um, small particles that were as little as, uh, I think these are sort of 600 nanometers. It's actually a really, really good study. I'd recommend uh, everybody, anyone interested in having a good read of that one. Uh, we also had a, a new one come out just a few weeks ago um, out, of, out of Ferenc's uh, lab, in fact, or at least the users uh, came by his lab. Uh, and this was a cultural heritage example looking at um, metal and glass objects from a cultural heritage perspective. Um, and this is a, a novel result because doing this with a regular IR just wouldn't work. You, you, you can't take uh, such a rough material and then point an infrared beam at that and get uh, interpretable spectra back. But, well, you can with OPTIR. And so this is the spectra you get out of it. Uh, you, you see glass peaks, you see four main carbonates, um, and in this case, they've done a small two-dimensional hyperspectral mapping exercise. Um, and have generated some maps, uh, single point spectra from these points you can see. And the spectra all here are pretty much uncorrected. This is what you see. You don't get these sort of dispersive uh, scattering artifacts. Uh, another hot off the press paper um, is one from uh, Roth Reddy's group at the University of Houston where he couples uh, some polarization rotation uh, to look at uh, collagen orientation within tissues uh, as, as, an, as an added channel of information. In addition to the chemical distribution, it's also uh, you, can, you can garner some information from the orientation. Uh, and really up until now, uh, FTIR has been used a lot, uh, even some of these emerging QCL techniques, but they're always limited in their resolution. You can see between A, between a and B here, there's a huge difference in resolution between FTIR and OPTIR. And if we in fact zoom in, we can actually look at these individual one micron collagen fibers, which FTIR cannot see, but you can see with OPTIR. Right? Um, and then on this far right column here, uh, they've looked at the AMY2 to AMY1 ratios as a function of different polarization angles. Uh, and, and this is what the spectra look like as well. So we've got glass. And this is actually on glass, and that's another real benefit of this technique is that you can use glass as a substrate. Um, and when you're interested in these AMO1 and AMO2 ratios, um, it's really quite simple through. It's all software controlled polarization ratios, ratio changes. Um, one from probably 2020 now, another high impact factor journal looking at neurons uh, and looking at um, protein secondary structure differences in neurons. Um, this is, I, like, I like this figure because it's really showing the incredible resolution even down to sort of 282 nanometers and how between those you actually get real chemical differences indicating in this case more uh, beta sheet structures in one of, one of those points. Uh, very quickly this was a polymer example looking at a biodegradable polymer laminate, a PLA and a PHA layer. The laminated, uh, interested at what's happening at the surface, at the interface rather, so we can do a simple uh, one-dimensional line, line array or linear line array of that 
uh, collecting OPTIR and RAM spectra simultaneously. If we just focus on the um, OPTIR data uh, across that interface, all of these spectra here are separated by only 100 nanometers. You can see even with 100 nanometer steps, you see strong chemical differences. Um, and taking single frequencies of those at 1725 and 1760, we get a, uh, an image that you'd expect. Um, but taking uh, a line profile across here, uh, we can see how sharp that edge is, around 327. And that one I'd show it here through some of the 2D correlation data analysis that have worked out that the reason why these two layers are actually quite compatible when they're expected not to be is the fact that the PHA at this interface, when in contact with PLA, is actually a lot more amorphous and, there's, and, and thus it's a lot more compatible with the already quite amorphous PLA layer. Uh, this is a really good example to show of where when Raman fails, OPTIR will not and cannot. So this is a forensic application looking at a paint chip cross-section from a sort of a vehicle accident, I think it was. Uh, so single point spectra were taken in these red, blue and green dots at these three different layers. And the Raman, this is the, the simultaneously collected Raman, uh, so if there's fluorescence, of course, even the, the, the Raman channel uh, on our instrument will still show, show fluorescence, as it did in this case with the red and the green, uh, the blue uh, worked. Uh, but even when the even in the red and green spots, the OPTI spectra are completely uh, unaffected by fluorescence. Uh, fibers are, are an interesting example, because they're actually quite difficult with traditional IR and QCL measurements. Uh, in this case, we've been able to collect high quality spectra, again, without any uh, data processing. This is, these are raw spectra, as you can see, uh, evolving on the screen. And along the length of this fiber, we can see that there are additives that are changing along the length. But whether it's a 20 micron fiber or an 800 nanometer fiber, the spectra still look like interpretable, uh, recognizable spectra. Uh, very quickly, this is a phase dispersion. Um, I like this one because when you zoom in and do a really high resolution step image, uh, you can see some incredibly small features um, and spectra on and off these hotspots look like, as you might expect, and you roll, and this, this is a ratio image, by the way, it's 1759 uh, and 1733, and we can see where the ratio, where the um, contrast in these images are, originate from, if we zoom through that one. Uh, so even some of these small ones can be in a sort of a couple hundred odd nanometer region. Um, cells in water are actually relatively easy with this technique. This is a cheek cell in water example, a cheek cell uh, placed into a calcium fluoride slide with a calcium fluoride cover slip on top. Uh, when I collected, this is actually one that, one that I did myself, when I collected some single point spectra from around the cell, um, I saw that there were some lipid features, there were some nucleic acid features, and of course protein is quite ubiquitous. Um, and when I collect a single frequency image on those three uh, wavelengths alone and, and combine them together in this RGB overlay. Lo and behold, it actually looks like a stunning, almost fluorescent-like image where you can see uh, very small lipid droplets and nucleic acid, of course, concentrated in the center. And some of these are sort of half a micron uh, in size. Um, in terms of particular examples, especially in the context of, of microplastics, this, I think, is a really powerful example showing of how 500 nanometer polystyrene beads are measured in seconds simultaneously with infrared and Raman. Right, so here, this is, this is in red, we have the OPTR spectrum. In green, I should label these. In green, we have these, we have, this is the Raman. So again, half a micron bead measured in seconds. But whether it's a half a micron bead or a cluster of, of two micron beads, the spectrum look the same. There are no dispersive scattering artifacts. So OPTR generates repeatable spectra that are independent of particle shape and size or sample sample roughness. Okay. Uh, study out of the, um, the Andy Alt group uh, in Michigan, looking at atmospheric particles, uh, where he used both infrared and Raman. Um, Kathy Goff out of um, uh, University of Manitoba in Canada looked at collagen orientation again, taking advantage of the inherent polarized nature of, of Q cells and rotating the polarization. Um, I'm going to just quickly go through these. These are these the half micron uh, collagen fibrils um, where the M1182 ratios are changed quite a fair bit depending on the polarization orientation. I'm going to flip through those. Uh, these were um, cancerous and normal cells on glass that we were able to differentiate. Um, based solely on their OPTIR spectra, again, on glass. So this is very really clinically translatable. 
Uh, and, and just to give you a sense of the quality of the spectrometry that you obtain, so these these are single scans, about one second each. You see, you see some glass, of course, because they're on glass. Uh, the rest of the spectrum is super high quality, half micron spot, no processing whatsoever. Uh, and you can do you know, lipid chain length images. We can take these ratios or the proteins uh, and obtain some you know, pretty stunning images, I think. Um, live cell imaging. This is a, a paper out of Peter Gardner Group in Manchester where they compared fixed and live cells uh, doing simultaneous IR and Raman. Uh, and of course, you know, this sort of work is quite difficult with regular FTI because you're going to use a seven micron path length cell, which is incredibly difficult to work with. Uh, but here they use this sort of upside down cell configuration where the cell is actually sitting upside down so the IR light hits it first, doesn't have to go through all that water. Uh, and then we measure the probe being actually in transmission mode. So that was a study that worked out quite well. I think this is my final um, example, uh, looking at back, single bacteria. Uh, up until now, the only chance of doing single bacteria would have been with, with the Raman microscope, but now in the infrared, you can do single bacteria as well. And, and they've, they've actually now upgraded to Raman, so they can do infrared and Raman on single bacteria. Uh, but in this example, they had uh, they, they, they fed the bacteria in different isotopes of carbon and nitrogen. Uh, that greatly shifts the AMI1 and AMI2 ratios. Uh, and from, through some sophisticated analysis of that, a lot can be gleaned about the uh, metabolic pathways of these, of these cells. Uh, it's an example of a E. coli cell that's been measured, imaged at 50 nanometer step sizes, just a simple uh, AMI1 image. Uh, and even in an intracellular uh, spectra from a single bacterium, uh, shown here as well. Um, and this was a silent region chip, so we've actually got some CD absorbances because these E. coli were uh, grown in, in heavy water, partial heavy water. And I think my final example here is of a, a simultaneous IR and Raman spectrum of a single E. coli bacteria. So you can see the collection time here is about a minute. Um, IR spectra, really high quality. Raman, decent quality, but of course Raman is always, um, will always lag behind when it comes to uh, signal noise, but for the first time now, we can collect infrared and Raman from single bacteria, uh, which I think is pretty exciting. Uh, I'm going to quickly move on to my uh, little takeaways, my conclusions. Um, by combining infrared well, well, with OPTIR, we can get submicron inflation, so you see a lot more detail. It's non contact, it's reflection mode, so there's no cross contamination, and the preparation is easy. No dispersive scattering artifacts, so the spectra are insensitive. insensitive to sample shape and size and only sensitive to the chemistry, which is really, of course, what we care about at the, at the end of the day. Uh, little to no sample prep, uh, new, new few cell options, uh, expanding the range of, of applications. Uh, and we've also recently added the ability to add a fluorescence module on the top, so you can actually do co-located OPTIR and Raman based off fluorescence images. Uh, and I'll finish off by saying IR plus Raman, it's all about the same spot, same time, same resolution. All right, everybody, thank you. Um, I've just come to the end of my first half of this talk. Uh, without any further ado, I'll pass over to Ferenc, uh, for as our main guest for the second half of this talk to see what he's been doing at the Soleil Synchrotron with this talk. So, uh, Ferenc, over to you. Thank you very much, Mustafa, and uh, thanks for the very nice talk and the introductions on the, on the technique and everything. And so today I'm going to talk about OPTIR in multi-user facilities. And uh, as you can see here, they have two logos. One is the institute where I work, is the Soleil Synchrotron in France. And the other one is the logo of my beamline, which is the Smith beamline, which basically works with infrared spectrum microscopy. So one thing I want to point out here is that if you want to look at the slides that I'm presenting today, that they are available under this link, so don't make any notes. <clears throat> just uh, just go to this bit.ly slash smith optir22 link and then you can see what you are going to see right now. So multi-user facilities, uh, in our case this is a synchrotron and uh, I prepared one or two slides about what actually a synchrotron is. So synchrotrons are large-scale facilities, large-scale science facilities, which are extremely expensive, so we operate 24-7 and uh, we operate in a proposal-based access mode. So basically you have to write a, 
um, a peer reviewed um, proposal and then depending on the peer review process you either get measurement time or not and um, then you can come and do your experiments at a synchrotron so the synchrotrons are particle accelerators that are producing light and they are very much tuned for x-rays but as you will see they also have infrared beam lines so just a few words here synchrotrons they are made up of uh, different subunits one is a linear accelerator which produces electrons typically and they accelerate them to a certain energy and then these electrons are injected into a booster synchrotron which increases the energy to to some value and then after the booster we inject them into a storage ring where they are circulating and circulating and in each turn each uh, red or orange structure here which are magnets they produce light and these are typically as i said x-rays and uh, where they produce the light we couple them into a specific uh, um, let's say spectrometer which we call a beamline where you can do different types of experiments so Soleil is a 2.75 uh, giga electron volt energy third generation synchrotron we are very close to Paris, about 30 kilometers, and we are on the Paris Saclay campus, um, which is one of the biggest universities now in uh, in France. And currently, we are operating 27 X-ray beam lines and two infrared beam lines at the same time. So you can imagine that we are doing 29 experiments at any given time, and the two infrared beam lines are called L and the Smith. And I said Smith is a uh, my beam line. So I'm going to show you just a map about infrared beam lines around the world. So here on this map, you can see the little markers. These are the synchrotrons currently operating all around the world. And the red ones are the ones which have uh, infrared beam lines in, uh, in the facility. So you can see that uh, synchrotron infrared is an important uh, contributor to the synchrotron world. Although again, synchrotrons are tuned for X-rays and, uh, and we are contributing with the with a worldwide presence we have a very nice uh, infrared user community and if we uh, come to my beam line which is uh, again the smith beam line in the soleil synchrotron we have uh, uh, been collecting and building our instrument park for for uh, quite some time now and uh, so here you can see an overview of our capabilities in terms of instrumentation so we can go basically from a few tens of nanometers through uh, a few hundreds of nanometers through microns to even centimeters uh, infrared uh, spectral microscopy. And of course, each one of these instruments have their own particularities and their own capabilities. But uh, today we are going to talk about the phototermal infrared and its combinations with all kinds of, uh, all kinds of instruments. But first I want to point to one important aspect that uh, in microscopy light cannot be really focused into an infinitely small point uh, but rather into a, a let's say a pattern presented here on the right and uh, you can see this in black and white but if I invert the figure then you see that uh, there are basically concentric circles uh, around the center point and uh, we call this pattern the area function and with this area function we can define the Rayleigh diffraction limit which I'm going to show you on the next slide but basically one important aspect here is that uh, there is a very strong source limitation because thermal sources that are found in any um, laboratory based infrared microscope or synchrotron and laser sources uh, behave different, differently and the point here is that uh, with synchrotron and laser sources, we can reach diffraction limited resolution. So what this means is that if we take this area function, and here you can see it in two dimension and on these figures, you can see it in one dimension. So basically just a slice of the image. Uh, we can define a specific uh, limit, which is the Rayleigh limit, where the maximum of, the, of one area function coincides with the with the position of the first ring of the of the second area function and we call this the Rayleigh limit now if we are our area functions or objects for that matter 
are further away from each other than this rail limit, then we can call this resolved. And if they are closer, then we can call this not resolved. So diffraction below the diffraction limit. And uh, in typical uh, absorption spectroscopy, this is pretty much what we can do. If the objects are too close to each other, then we cannot distinguish them. They have to be at a certain distance. And in the, in the infrared, this is typically several microns or several, um, let's say, tens of microns or below 10 micrometer uh, in the, in the mid-infrared. Now, the, the OPTIR technique uh, applies a very nice trick to overcome this diffraction limit. And uh, as you had heard from uh, Mustafa, the, the system basically uses two lasers to, to do the measurements. There is one laser, which is an IR laser. This we can consider it as a pump laser and the visible laser, which we can, which we can uh, use for probing the effect of the infrared illumination. So in principle, actually, this is a diffraction limited system. But since our excitation is in the infrared, and our detection is in the visible. In our case, it's a green laser. You can see that the, the, the infrared diffraction limit is bypassed by several times. So instead of having, a, let's say, a 10 micrometer spot, we have a 500 nanometer spot because that's typically the, the wavelength of the green laser. So OPTIR spatial resolution goes from, let's say, 4 to 10 micron to 0 0.5 micron, which is a huge improvement. And uh, there is an additional benefit that uh, typically in absorption spectroscopy, we are limited uh, by the wavelength, which also means that uh, at uh, four micron wavelength, we have four micron resolution and at 10 micron wavelength, we have 10 micron resolution. But in the OPTIR, this uh, 500, 500 nanometer resolution doesn't change throughout the whole spectral range. So that's a very nice uh, aspect of the technique. Um, as you've seen uh, on my one of my previous slides where I was talking about the instrumentation of the of the beam line, you can combine uh, with quite a few instruments and uh, I'm going to show you a few examples of combinations. So typically what we would want to achieve is high spatial resolution, large spectral bandwidth and uh, lots of information content. And of course, everybody would like to have everything and uh, if we can uh, find the, the cross section of the middle, then, uh, then the study that, uh, that is in progress is, is probably benefiting the most of all kinds of uh, instrumentation. So I'm going to talk about how to combine Mirage with the synchrotron IR, with FTIR imaging, Raman, which you've already heard about from Mustafa, with X-ray fluorescence uh, from the synchrotron uh, X-rays, confocal fluorescence, uh, scanning uh, AFM techniques and uh, even micro CT. So let's uh, dive in and start with uh, with biology. And first, I'm going to talk about Alzheimer research, which uh, the first example is going to be with synchrotron and uh, and the OPTIR uh, combination. This is the work from Oksana Klementieva from the Lund University in Sweden, who we are collaborating with for many years now. And so the point here is that dementia has a, a huge societal impact. And uh, if you want to imagine the numbers, every three seconds, there's a new diagnosis of dementia in the world. And uh, the projection is that by 2030, this is going to be two trillion uh, US dollars cost for the treatments. So if we can mitigate these, uh, these cases or we can understand better the, the processes underlying the, the disease, it's going to be a huge economic impact and a positive one. And so here we have uh, used OPTIR and uh, synchrotron IR to image neurons which were grown um, to have uh, expression of beta amyloid uh, plaques, which are responsible for the Alzheimer, uh, the development of the Alzheimer. So here on the left, you see the optical image of a neuron and on the right, you can see two single wavelength images, one at 1630 and one at 1650 uh, wave numbers. And uh, one of them is, uh, is the alpha helix and the other one is the, the, the beta amyloid signature. So we can see that uh, there are clear differences between the two images and the ratio of the two images can really describe where the beta amyloid is accumulating in, the, in these neurons. 
So this is the, the data that OPTI are provided. And then we have been uh, verifying this with the synchrotron infrared, which is not as high resolution, but provides extremely nice uh, um, signal to noise ratio at even, even at, the, at the single cell limit. And the databases are really well known and the, the description of the, the beta amyloids and Alzheimer has been well established. So what we could see that indeed uh, our OPTIR data can show the beta amyloids and we could, uh, we could really nicely verify this with the, with the synchrotron uh, uh, infrared data. And uh, we published this in Advanced Science in 2020. Now, after this point, we were trying to dive in even more to this, uh, to this um, problematic of Alzheimer. And uh, we, we tried to combine uh, other synchrotron techniques with the OPTIR. And Oksana uh, got beam time at a, at a beam line called Nanoscopium in Soleil, which is an X-ray fluorescence uh, a mapping beam line with very high resolution. So typically about a few hundreds of nanometers, but at some cases even higher. So the, the length scales are very nicely compatible with OPTIR. So what we, what we basically did, we took uh, OPTIR data, I mean, optical images first, we took synchrotron X-ray fluorescence data, then the infrared data, and then we combined these to really understand the chemistry of the samples from two sides. And the, the two sides are that uh, infrared can really provide information about the beta amyloid and the, and the vibrational uh, signatures of different molecules. And the x-rays, they can really nicely follow heavy metals. So, and not, not only the, the location of these heavy metals, but also the oxidation states of uh, different, uh, different um, metals. So therefore we can, we can infer let's say oxidative stress and the accumulation of amyloid beta. So if we plot all these together, put all these data together, then we can very nicely show the, the protein signatures inside these neurons. Here is an optical image, here is the, the IR image, and then we can mask this and match the same neuron with the, with the X-ray beam line and then see where the iron, for example, is accumulating or where the iron and oxidized lipids are colocalized and, uh, or, or even iron and beta sheet structures. So this is my, my point here that this is an extremely powerful approach where you can understand the elemental speciation and the chemical uh, constitution of, of neurons. Then uh, another combination of, uh, of OPTIR with, uh, with another infrared technique was, uh, was uh, to see if we can see even uh, higher details within these neurons. So you already know about OPTIR. Here we are using an IR excitation and visible sampling. And the resolution is typically on the order of, of uh, 500 nanometer. However, if we uh, exchange the green laser in our case to an AFM tip, then we can still use IR beam to probe, to, to excite our sample and we can get the, the response from this AFM tip, which is extremely sharp. So now instead of 500 nanometers, we can go to 20 nanometer resolution and we can be uh, extremely surface sensitive as well. So these two techniques have, diff have uh, uh, different uh, probing depths. And uh, this work was uh, again in, in collaboration with Oksana Klementieva and Raul Freitas from the, from the Brazilian synchrotron. And uh, I'm just going to give you a highlight here about the results. So again, on the, on the left, this is uh, what we have previously also seen in neurons. We can very nicely uh, record spectra of the, of the um, protein structures and the image where the the amyloid beta is accumulating in uh, or not accumulating in case of wild type neurons and then with the transgenic neurons we can see the increase of amyloid beta and then we could put all these uh, cells these um, that express amyloid beta structures into the scanning microscope the afm microscope that uh, combines infrared and afm and you could you could see again the same type of uh, of data here, this is a larger picture. Here you can see that the scale bar is 500 nanometers and we have extremely high resolution data where we can also record spectra 
and again see the increase and the change of the of the amyloid beta and the alpha helix uh, structures so so this was a very nice because both techniques are below the infrared diffraction limit they are both high resolution high spatial resolution but uh, we could even discover heter heterogeneity at the 20 nanometer length scale so that was a that was a very nice study uh, if we uh, consider other biological systems i have a couple of other examples one is uh, on biomineralization which basically occurs all around the human body and it's usually not a favorable process for example if we think about kidney stones many many people are suffering from this kind of disease and uh, very often the chemistry of these biomineralized uh, stones is very important and it can determine the treatment that has to be followed so the problem of course is that these uh, these diseases are hard to measure for multiple issues in ftir we can have uh, light scattering i mean regular absorption spectroscopy we can have light scattering and in raman spectroscopy which is higher resolution the samples can be extremely light sensitive so so it's a tricky type of sample to measure but um, optir can also address this question and in this this case what we did we used the mouse model which uh, expresses an abcc6 mutation which uh, basically leads to deficient deficiency in pyrophosphate that is a key inhibitor for calcium phosphate crystallization so what this results in is uh, that uh, if we have this mutation then we can have some some calcium uh, uh, deposits but if we add vitamin d then these calcium deposits even further increase and so the the colleagues of uh, dominique bazin wanted to understand uh, these kind of processes and see really the the chemical spectroscopy aspect of this kind of uh, images that they could uh, they could do with the just stained sections so here they combine the scanning electron microscopy uh, energy disper dispersive x-rays and and mirage and they could really nicely see from after locating on the optical image they could nicely image the deposits in the scm they could really measure the elemental composition so they can verify that indeed these uh, uh, deposits are largely made of uh, calcium and then after taking it out from the SCM they could drill in further with the with the with the mirage and see how the calcium the, the phosphate basically accumulates in these uh, these deposits so that was also a, a very interesting study on biomineralization and they keep um, um, pursuing this uh, this line and they are working on other kidney stones and the mineralization processes um for uh, finishing the biology part i have uh, basically just one slide for you here on um, on cosmetology or cosmetics and uh, this is the work of uh, one of my colleagues here at the smith beamline christoph sant who is uh, who is studying hair for many years now and uh, so he has uh, recently discovered that uh, that hair is, although it's uh, quite well studied already can still present some kind of surprises and so he combined the two-dimensional uh, hyperspectral FTIR imaging synchrotron FTIR and the OPTIR and so what he discovered that in the medullas which is basically the center part of the of the hair uh, sometimes we can see unexpected uh, chemistry and so what he saw is uh, basically steroids can uh, accumulate inside the medullas. So uh, you can see that uh, here, uh, the blue spectrum is a typical medulla spectrum and uh, the purple one or magenta one is a calcium sterate from a database. And uh, moreover, he could also match different type of sterates. So different chain length, uh, organic chain length sterates within the, within the hair. And these two, actually, all these spectra that you see here, they are recorded with the synchrotron. Uh, what, uh, what the OPTIR reveals is even uh, higher heterogeneity at the submicron level. And I'm not going to show any of the figures here because uh, this has not been published yet. So, so we cannot, uh, cannot show the actual maps, but uh, stay tuned and then you will see how this is uh, unfolding even further at the higher resolution limit. 
Uh, if we shift gears a little bit, I, I would like to show you uh, let, by highlighting uh, other fields how versatile the OPTIR technique is. And so <clears throat> we have uh, some colleagues who've been working on cultural heritage and art conservation. So what I'm going to show here is the, the work of Victoria Beltran from the University of Antwerp. And in this study, they were measuring uh, um, samples from a Van Gogh uh, painting, this uh, which you see on the right here. So the peculiarity of these uh, paintings is that uh, sometimes the, the pigments that Van Gogh used, and uh, actually some of his contemporaries as well, uh, were not so stable. So what I mean by this is that if you, for example, look at the side of this painting, and you can see that the pink is much pinker than on the front. And the reason is that the, the side was in the frame, and obviously the front was exposed to light and the environment. So the protected part retained much more of the color that, than the exposed part. And this is, a, this is a problem if you have a Van Gogh that you probably bought for a few hundred million euros, and it's simply just fading away. So it's a very important thing to understand the chemistry and the, the processes behind this. So what is happening, it's very clear that it's a photo damage of the pigments and the result is that the colors are disappearing. So what you see here is, a, is a, the sample. So we didn't have the actual painting under the microscope. We just had some uh, chips which were on the order of 100 micrometers. And then we, we sectioned these to make a, a nice surface. And again, we, we used two techniques, synchrotron-based FTIR and OPTIR to understand the chemistry inside, the, inside these uh, pigments. So first I'm going to show the synchrotron IR mapping. Here, um, what you can see is that uh, in this section, we could very nicely identify all the constituents basically. So we could see epoxy, which we used for the embedding, proteins inside the structure. So it's most likely some kind of uh, uh, carrier that they uh, disperse the pigments in. We could see cellulose from the canvas, the oil for the paint, some minerals and lead white as well, which was, uh, which was also a pigment for, for white color. And we could see, we could record the, the spectra of all these um, constituents. The paper is, uh, is now out. It, it was published uh, last year and it was deemed as one of these hot papers in the Angevanta Chemie. And uh, after doing the synchrotron mapping, we of course turned into the higher resolution OPTIR technique and now we have been concentrating on a much, much smaller area at a much higher resolution. And again, we can see, still see the optical image of these uh, section, uh, sections, basically. And then by, uh, by mapping out uh, the different uh, infrared absorption peaks, we can identify with the infrared where these uh, components are located. So this was very nice and, and confirming the, the synchrotron IR results, but very importantly, um, so we could also record the, the spectra with the OPTIR, but very importantly, we could match some of the spectra from the, from the high resolution maps with the geranium lake reference. So these are the pink pigments that are basically uh, light sensitive. And, uh, and this is a very important um, step towards understanding the, the photochemistry of these, these pigments and, of course, eventually protecting the paintings from fading away uh, between, uh, between the creation and, uh, and as time passes. Um, so, another, yet another field is uh, chemistry, the application of OPTR in chemistry. And here I'm going to talk about uh, high-resolution three-dimensional molecular orientation. And uh, this is the work of uh, Thomas Robel from the Solaris Synchrotron, who we are collaborating with. And uh, so just a few words to, to better uh, present this about uh, light polarization. So if we have non-polarized light and we put a molecule into this, uh, this light beam, if the molecule orientation is like the, the red arrow, then it's going to absorb mostly from the polarization that falls into this direction. 
if it's uh, in the orientation of this blue arrow, then it will ab prefer absorbing the, the blue part of the, of the beam, the blue polarization. And if we translate this into uh, a polarized uh, a case, which is actually the OPTIR, then um, what we, we can use this for, if we have a, a polarized laser, then we can put molecules in different orientations. And if the molecules are in the red orientation, then they will not absorb. If they are in the blue, then they absorb maximum. And if they are in between, then they will absorb some. So we can very easily get two-dimensional orientation information from just a, just a simple uh, measurement. But we can go one step further. And so if we use, uh, instead of just one um, dipole moment that, uh, that I was showing you in the, in the previous slide, we use several bonds, let's say two bonds that are mostly perpendicular to each other. And we use four angles, basically four measurements then instead of just a two-dimensional orientation map, we can uh, calculate the three-dimensional orientation of these molecules. And here is a pretty complex uh, scheme of how to do this. I think it was, uh, yes, it was this paper that, uh, that introduced this method. But uh, the bottom line is that we need to make four measurements at four different polarizations, and then we can calculate the orientation maps of, uh, of our polymers. So let's see. This is how it, the, the results look like. I'm not going to go into very many details, but I want to point this out that it's a, it's a new approach for chemists to describe uh, polymers. And uh, here in our study, we actually combined again, OPTIR, FTIR imaging with a two-dimensional detector and Raman uh, microscopy as well. So here on the right, you can see that uh, we have the two dipole or transition moments, because in, in the case of Raman, we are talking about polarizability, but the, the technique is equally applicable to this as well. And uh, we could very, very nicely uh, calculate from the FTIR, from the OPTIR, the orientation vectors of these, uh, these molecules. And uh, you, can, you can see this, uh, it is published already on the Chem Archive, and hopefully it will be soon uh, fully published in the uh, image journal. So I came to my conclusion, which um, is pretty simple in this case. I wanted to show you that OPTIR is an extremely powerful technique. And uh, I think especially in combination with other modalities like synchrotron IR, FTIR imaging, Raman, synchrotron X-rays. And um, there are many advantages for, uh, for OPTIR. The sample preparation is quite simple and uh, this is, uh, this is often a um, uh, factor that, uh, that we need to consider. So I said in the beginning that you can, uh, you can see my presentation, but you can also go to this other link where you can see all the papers that are published from the Beamline and uh, you know, dig further and, uh, and enjoy the science that we are producing. Uh, I just have two more slides to add here. If you are interested to work with us, either with, the, with the, our Mirage or even the combination of the synchrotron techniques, then uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, Soleil has a proposal cycle, which is two times a year, uh, typically February and September. And I think the next deadline is going to be around September 15. So please visit the Soleil website and then uh, send in a proposal, it's, uh, it's quite easy. And uh, yet another teaser for you, uh, here there is a, a very nice study that, uh, that you can see. This is not OPTIR, but is it, it is infrared. So you can see what we are working on typically on, uh, on many other groups. And this, in this case, it's, uh, it's space samples. So this is all I, I would want to say about OPTIR. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you, Ferry, for that uh, really exciting and interesting and very broad uh, talk as well, which I suppose was the point of this um, webinar. Uh, now, I've been sitting here in the background um, watching uh, lots of questions fly in. I'm also conscious of time, so um, we'll ask as many as we can, and we'll see how we, how we go for time at the very end. Uh, first one, I would say I'm going to point your way, uh, says, uh, could you comment on the summer preparation requirements 
especially for the combination of different techniques? Please. Yeah, so um, as I said in the, in uh, my my last uh, conclusion side, slide, um, for OPTIR, sample preparation is quite simple. I, we rarely have to uh, do, uh, you know, suffer. Uh, so basically, we, we if we have uh, just any kind of uh, thin sections for biological samples or cells, then we can directly use it for measurements. Typically, for combination techniques, the the requirement, the stronger requirement, is from the other side. So let's say. If we are doing FTIR, the samples have to be thin enough for trans to, to be able to transmit the light, or they have to be reflective to, to reflect the IR, or often uh, for X-rays, they have uh, specific requirements for um, special substrates and, and so on. But the OPTIR itself is quite, a, quite an easy technique for sample preparation. Okay, uh, next one I'll send your way as well, Ferry. This one says, um, how comparable are the FTIR and OPTIR spectra when working on biological samples and cells? Uh, so I uh, will probably refer back to the beta amyloid study. So I think, I, I don't know if, if uh, you are very familiar with the, with the bio, bio spectroscopy, but uh, if you just look at this figure, I mean, it looks very nice. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's quite comparable to normal FTIR. It happens sometimes, if, uh, especially in the, in the case of the hair study that we, we could see, that uh, because of the averaging uh, of, uh, of normal uh, FTIR, we can have some surprises, but this is not coming from the actual um, uh, technique differences. It's coming, it is coming from, from the heterogeneity difference. So let's say the FTIR averages over a large spot, and then it looks like a normal biospectrum. And when we look at it with, the, with OPTIR, then we can have a surprise. And that just because, because, for example, there is a tiny calcium steroid grain right where we are measuring. And then it, of course, looks very different from a normal biospectrum. Actually, if I, I may even add a little bit to that, if I may, uh, it's important to also remember that um, with, with OPTIR, we're typically measuring most biologicals in reflection mode. So there's a sort of certain uh, simplicity and ease of sampling that comes with it. And even though we measure OPTR in reflection mode, the spectra that we acquire are completely comparable um, to those that have been collected with FTI, say in transmission mode or with ATR mode. Um, next one, I think I'll take on my own actually. This one says, how thick or thin can samples be? Uh, are there any limits? And uh, make me a fairy. Feel free to jump in as well. Uh, but you know, I know in our applications lab, uh, we've gone as thin as something like uh, 50, 60 nanometers, perhaps. Um, and as for thickness, well, there is really no limit. Uh, so that, again, one of the um, the nice aspects of working in this uh, reflection mode, uh, we, thickness isn't a concern. So whether you're working, say, a hundred nanometer thin um, section or a for a centimeter thick section, it, it really doesn't matter. It's only the top uh, few microns that we'll be sampling from. Uh, so from that sense, um, you know, whether it's a thin slice or a thick slice, it really doesn't matter. Um, yeah, uh, anything to add from your side on that theory? No, no, I think you covered it pretty okay. well. The, the thinnest samples that we have measured were the dried uh, neurons okay. and uh, where they are really thin, then they are a couple couple of hundred or even just a hundred nanometer thick. So yeah, it's, uh, it's quite accurate. All right. Um, this one I'll throw away, Ferry. Um, is it possible to measure in liquids and live cells? Uh, so I, yeah, so the answer is yes. Uh, we have uh, tried liquids already, and I think you have tried uh, live cells, right? Yes, I have, and there's some okay. exciting stuff that will be coming out um, in the coming couple of months. So I, I may tease the audience with a little bit of that. And um, I'll just suffice to say that live cells uh, will be extremely easy to measure with the water dipping objective. I'll say that much, but that'll be coming out in a couple of months. Um, okay, and this one I'll take as well. This, this may be the um, 
last one. I think, yeah, this will be the last one. Uh, what is the total laser power? And actually, I know Theory have done a lot of work on this as well. So, of course, it depends. There's there's two lasers. Of course, there's the infrared and the visible um, probe laser. On the infrared side, depending on where you are in the spectrum, it could be as much as, say, say uh, quite a few um, milliwatts to some tens of milliwatts of power. And of course, all the power is very uh, controllable in the software. Uh, and like with any sort of laser-based system, you, you do need to be mindful of power. And you would just adjust it accordingly for particular sample needs. Uh, on the probe side, uh, this is something that I don't think I covered, actually. I always forget to do this. Um, for those samples that are particularly sensitive to green light, the 532, uh, which, by the way, is uh, probably outputting, by the time it reaches the sample, you're probably looking at many tens of milliwatts, maybe several tens of milliwatts. Um, but for those samples that are very sensitive to probe green light, uh, we can run that down to a few tens of microwatts of power. And we can do that without really sacrificing sensitivity, which is in, in, which is in contrast to Raman, where if you had to lower the laser power down, you also suffer correspondingly or proportionally a drop in signal noise. And, and with OPTIR, we actually switch detectors. We go from a standard silicon photodiode, we switch to an avalanche photodiode detector, an APD, which is a great detector, but it only operates well in very low light conditions and it's ultra, ultra sensitive. So when we switch to that low level, um, low light level detector, we get signal noise as good as a uh, standard detector, though we operate, you know, in so in the, you can operate as low as sort of tens of, of microwatts, and, and and I know, Ferry, you guys use the APD a lot, in fact, probably more than I do. Any comments? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, we, we really prefer this uh, this uh, sensitive detector because it allows us to really decrease the, the light intensity. Okay. All right, I think um, we'll have to wrap this up now. So, uh, Ferry, thanks again for your time. I know um, you've been, in fact, you know, amazing with with how, you know, giving uh, various users access to the lab, and, and that's now being reflected in the, in the number of publications coming out of your lab that are based on uh, on OPTIR. So uh, it's good for you, it's good for us, um, it's good for the scientific community. Uh, so again, thank you for your time. Uh, as for the audience members, I of course thank you guys for logging in and listening in. This webinar is uh, being recorded and will be available on our website. We'll send the link out uh, within some days and feel free to send that link on to friends and colleagues. And with that, I'll say goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.